It's been called the perfect storm. War-torn Yemen on the brink of famine and struggling with the world's worst outbreak of cholera. Now the UN is not sending in life-saving vaccines, blaming the warring parties. So is Yemen headed for a catastrophe and are calls for help falling on deaf ears? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rochelle Carey. The UN humanitarian chief is warning that cases of cholera in Yemen have increased dramatically in what he's describing as a man-made disaster. 120,000 more people have been diagnosed with the disease in just the past six weeks. Stephen O'Brien has blamed those fighting the war for fueling the outbreak and making it impossible to get vaccines to the people in need. He says they should feel deeply guilty at driving a worsening conflict and exposing millions of civilians to unfathomable pain and suffering. We have a lot to get to with our guests. First, though, Daniel Lack reports from the U.N. A disease spread through infected drinking water and bad sanitation. Cholera is soaring in much of war-torn Yemen. What's called the world's worst outbreak of the disease is affecting more than 320,000 people. Officials say those numbers will rise as reports come in from remote areas. Health workers in Yemen say it's becoming more difficult to treat those who are falling ill. We used to receive between 100 to 150 cases per day. Then the numbers declined for about a week or so. And then, without any warning, the cases hiked up again. We are facing shortages of medicines, especially IV drips. Yemen has been at war since 2015 in the takeover of the capital Sana'a by Houthi rebels, said by the U.S. and others to be backed by Iran. They're fighting Yemeni government forces that have considerable military support from a coalition of Arab states led by Saudi Arabia. At a briefing to the Security Council, the U.N.'s humanitarian chief said there was no doubt who was to blame for the cholera epidemic. This cholera scandal is entirely man-made by the conflicting parties and those beyond Yemen's borders who are leading, supplying, fighting and perpetuating the fear and the fighting. Mr. O'Brien called for a ceasefire so war-damaged health clinics could be rebuilt and medical workers paid. He said the UN needed a quarter billion dollars to deal with the situation and so far had just a fraction of that. The conflict has also put millions of Yemenis, many of them women and children, at risk of starvation. With UN-led political efforts to end the war apparently stalled, the humanitarian crisis in Yemen is worsening by the day. Daniel Lack, Al Jazeera at the United Nations. According to the latest figures, more than 1,700 people have died from cholera since late April. There are more than 320,000 suspected cases of the disease in Yemen, and on average, 5,000 new cases recorded every day. The United Nations says the $2.1 billion in humanitarian appeal for Yemen is only one-third funded. The UN says the response to the cholera outbreak requires an additional $250 million, of which just $47 million has been received. Two years of conflict have killed more than 10,000 people, wounded tens of thousands, and displaced millions. Let's bring in our guests on the panel now. In Sana, we are joined by Hussein al a pro-Houthi journalist. In London, Mohammed Jameh, a writer, columnist, and editor of the Al-Quds al Arabi newspaper. Also in Sana is Dr. Sharon Varki, the UNICEF representative in Yemen. Thank you all um, for joining me. Dr. Varki, I want to start with you. Um, how dire must the situation on the ground be for an, an aid organization to, to scrap an effort that could help people? How, how bad must it be for, for an organization to make that decision? Well, the situation is really dire. It was already a very troubling situation with more than two years of conflict, and the cholera outbreak is really turning the situation into catastrophic. We already have more than almost 320,000 cases of acute diarrheal disease along with close to 1,750 recorded deaths. What is important to note is almost half of these are children uh, when it comes to cases, and almost a quarter of the deaths are also children. This is a direct result of two years of the conflict, a crumbling economy, and a devastated health and sanitation system. In addition, we know that health workers 
and other public sector staff have not received salaries since the last nine months. All these conditions are creating the perfect environment to fuel the outbreak even further. We've and it is, of course, as you said very rightly, humanitarian actors must step in to do all they can. And the, the list that you just put out there um, is very thorough, and we're going to address all of those issues. I, I want to ask you, though, just from a, a medical point of view, how treatable is cholera, and, and what does it actually do to somebody? Cholera is an infectious disease which is highly contagious. If not treated, almost 50% of the cases can die. So most of the cases are mild and moderate and can be treated easily with simple treatment using oral rehydration solution. About 20% of the cases, which is the cause of concern, are severe and they need treatment with IV fluids for rehydration, as well as in some cases, antibiotics. The challenge is in Yemen, with less than 50% of the health facilities functional, it becomes very difficult to really launch a massive response. So agencies like UNICEF, along with partners, are in addition to setting up and strengthening health facilities as diarrhea treatment centers are also taking care closer to the community. We are opening oral rehydration corners as well as deploying almost 16,000 community health volunteers who are going house to house and treating cases as well as spreading awareness to families on how they can protect themselves and their children from this dreaded disease. You know, Dr. Varki, you talked about just basic infrastructure and services that have basically been decimated. And in fact, um, the um, International Committee of the Red Cross has also addressed that very specific issue. Let's go ahead and listen to uh, Carlos Marzani talk about that. The basic, the public, the basic services infrastructure of the country uh, has basically almost collapsed. Uh, public services like health, uh, access to clean water, treatment of wastewater, is something that is missing in this country at the moment. Public employees are not being paid. Therefore, uh, the population is unable to get all the, the basic services, basic access to, to, to water, to health service, to sanitation, to hygiene services. And all these have uh, the accumulation of wastewater. All these have created uh, the perfect storm to have uh, the type of spread that cholera is, 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 is witnessing in this country that the population is suffering in this country, something that should not happen here. Mohammed, what part of the country is being most severely affected by this outbreak? Well, I think the capital, Sana'a, it started, um, uh, as I know, in, in the capital of Sana'a and, and then spread to um, other provinces uh, until it reached Aden in the south and covers all the um, areas in Yemen. Um, uh, in Sana'a, uh, according to the uh, international reports, the health organization reports and other reports, um, uh, as, as your guest said in Sana'a, that most of the cases um, could be um, treated, uh, but uh, the lack of the medication, the lack of the, and the collapse, nearly collapse of the health system in Yemen um, made the, the situation in the country and in Sana'a especially more um, even worse and deteriorating. Um, now we um, have these different reports from the UN organization. Unfortunately, sometimes they say that uh, the situation in Yemen is under control and sometimes another report from the UN as well uh, saying different information. So they are like making it even worse in front of us as um, reporters or analysts to understand the whole situation and the whole image or picture in the country. But uh, regardless, uh, the situation is deteriorating and the uh, health system is collapsing. The uh, cholera is spreading um, in uh, different areas, in, um, uh, even, the, uh, even, even in the countryside. The problem is we can, uh, or the uh, health um, organizations and the uh, aid people can reach the people in Sana'a. But uh, there are so many areas, wide range of areas outside in the countryside whom the organizations and the health aid uh, people to. cannot reach. And this 
actually, um, uh, Mohammed, just to interrupt you for a moment, you did mention the UN. And in fact, um, the UN humanitarian chief, um, Stephen O'Brien, has been trying to, trying to beat the drum about this, saying that a lot of what is happening as he sees it is because people are not just abiding by basic international laws that dictate how you're supposed to treat humanitarian issues. This is some of what he had to say. All parties must comply with their responsibilities under international humanitarian and human rights law, and all states must exert their influence to ensure the parties do so. Today, they are not doing so, and this must change. To ensure that all ports and land routes remain open for both humanitarian and commercial imports in a predictable and stable manner. This includes continuing efforts to avert an attack on Hodeidah, to reopen Sana'a Airport, and for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to release airspace, and getting the paid for, desperately needed mobile cranes to Hodeidah port, rather than leaving them sitting useless, rotting on the Dubai quayside. Um, Hussein, what do you see as the, the real difficulty in getting aid to where it needs to be? I've seen that in all uh, the statement uh, about uh, cholera, uh, nobody has uh, touched the main issue of the spread uh, of cholera. Uh, it started uh, in many areas in Yemen, but uh, most cases uh, seems to be now in Sana'a because Sana'a is the capital and is the largest city and it has become a center for, for all IDBs or, or displaced people coming from around the, the country. Uh, the main problem is the Saudi blockade. The blockade has doubled, uh, sometimes tripled the price of fuel, and as well uh, the strikes on, 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 on the Sana'a airport and uh, uh, Hodeida port, and as well uh, the, the, the constant attack on roads, uh, roads and bridges. Uh, these roads and bridges links uh, between Yemen villages and Yemen towns, and this make it hard uh, for people to get uh, to hospital quickly and to get uh, treated and as well uh, to, to, to uh, uh, fight cholera is really, really easy. People just need clean water. And clean water, if we have no fuel and if the Saudi uh, constant attack uh, on uh, uh, water station and tank uh, uh, so water you're saying, tanks you're, across so uh, the country, you're saying, you're saying I you're saying think, think we think cannot those, fight uh, the cholera at all. So you're saying that you think that those attacks are actually deliberate to exacerbate the situation? They're targeted in that way? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, if, if yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not, it's not only uh, those attack uh, increase uh, uh, the cholera. We know that the starvation uh, cases in, in, in Yemen, in many areas, uh, many food tank and food stores uh, were targeted in Hodeida even after the outbreak of starvation. Like uh, 16 million of Yemeni people depend on food and still the Saudi keep uh, uh, not allowing food coming into Yemen, targeting food trucks. Uh, 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 and as well, uh, we know uh, Yemeni uh, health system is, is on the brink of collapse. And I can say it, it has actually collapsed and still we see the Saudi, they have targeted four uh, hospital belong to MSF, or as we call them, Doctor Without Border. And this had uh, forced MSF to withdraw from the north region of Yemen. They had the only two operated hospital in Hajja and in Saada, and they were closed because of Saudi direct strike. And to show you that the Saudi has failed uh, in their military effort uh, so, to uh, to face uh, Yemeni army and Ansar al Houthi, so they have used a method to have more pressure on the Yemeni people to make them suffer okay, more. So they think that the Houthi will be blamed for that, and they will uprise against okay, uh, the Doctor, Doctor Varki, let me ask you this: It seems like that even if more money were to come in, which obviously you can always use more money in a situation like this, but that actually at this point actually seems to be secondary, that even if there was enough money, there would still be these challenges in getting help to the people who need it. Having said that, unless something drastically changes, do you anticipate this, this getting worse? What I can say is, it is true. This is a man-made crisis. And both parties to the conflict have shown a blatant disregard for international humanitarian law. And it is important that the international forces bear down upon these parties to ensure that children uh, and their rights are protected. What is important is that early this year, the Yemen Humanitarian Response Plan uh, was released with a total ask of $2.1 billion. Of this, uh, there was a pledge, a total pledge of $1.1 billion. 
clearly much more is required and we have to see that these resources translate into action on the ground even in these difficult contexts the humanitarian actors are working round the clock large number of medical supplies water purification tablets have been flown in and using various mechanisms like community health volunteers and mobile teams uh, we are trying to reach every corner of the country okay but yes the challenge is quite steep mohammed what is life like for the average yemeni right now are are there stories getting out there are there voices being heard i know there's many journalists that are doing the best they can but journalists have also faced face challenges there well i think uh, before i answer that question what hussein said in sana is um, is to some extent right but he forgot to uh, mention the houthi side there is a siege around uh, the city of taiz by the houthis and if we are going to listen to their propaganda they said that the saudis uh, hit sana by missiles which brought cholera to sana by the, by by weapons i think they created the houthis created this problem by not paying the uh, people not paying the workers the clean workers in sanaa to take the rubbish out of the streets and this is the main reason reason for the uh, cholera in the in the country in sanaa spe- especially just, just a moment i think he, hold uh, on one, one regardless moment regardless that I think you bring up. I mean, oh, uh, hold on, hold on, gentlemen, gentlemen. Hussein, hold on, water, Hussein, Hussein, water. Hussein, Hussein, hold on a moment. All right, and Mohammed, I'll get back to you, but I think you actually bring up a good point that I want to put to Hussein. If you would just let me ask the question: What responsibility do the Houthis bear for getting services to the areas that they have controlled for quite some time? Uh, of course, the Houthi have uh, responsibility to to provide uh, health care and as well uh, security. Uh, in uh, areas they control uh, but if you see that uh, uh, what yemen has come to uh, during this war uh, yemen income uh, used to be 80% from fuel and gas and those are now under the control of uh, uh, the saudi led uh, coalition and as well 20% used to come from export and as well from uh, taxes and coming from airport and ports all ports and airport has been destroyed so uh, they have of course they have a task but it's difficult uh, to manage and to get all these and at the same time they have front to fight and they have the saudi blockade uh, and as well uh, in, in the, uh, it has been almost 10 months 10 uh, uh, since the saudi led coalition uh, coalition had uh, has stopped uh, paying the wages uh, during uh, when when the, when the bank was in sanaa houthi has ensured to pay salaries to all cities in Yemen, if, if areas under the control of Saudi-led coalition, for 18 months, uh, for 17 months, they used to pay salaries. And now we have seen that the international community and uh, Ismail Wild sheikh in his statement uh, at the UN Security Council, he has said that uh, they, uh, to, 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 to pay uh, the wages and salaries of the yes. public sector of Yemeni people, uh, the Houthi have to withdraw from 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 uh, Hodeida port, so they are using some of 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 of, of cases and the suffering of Yemeni people to have pressure okay. on the Houthis. And okay. Uh, the Saudi has not succeeded in invading Hodeida, so the UN wanted to withdraw. Okay. Uh, so hold, they hold, can hold. pay the salaries. Mohammed, um, Stephen O'Brien, we've already heard from him a, a little bit ago in the show. The the UN relief chief, he said, humanity can't continue to lose out to politics. So let's talk about the politics um, of this and, and the actual war itself. Has the, the Saudi-led bombing done anything to prop up the South? Well, I think uh, the Wildi Sheikh uh, suggested the, uh, the part of Hodeida to be given to um, people, to, be, to people and army and security forces not from the legitimate government or from the coup forces. Uh, but the Houthis refused the plan when he came to them. Uh, now we have this problem. The, the Houthis are in Hudayda, and the Saudi-led coalition and the forces of the government wanted to take it by force. I think the, the most important thing is the, the life of the civilians in Hudayda and to ensure the uh, food supply in the city because we have nearly two millions of people in of the Yemeni people in Hudaydah. 
I think the uh, solution which was suggested by the United Nations representative in Yemen must be taken into consideration. But unfortunately, instead of having this uh, seriously, the Houthis refused the plan. Now we are facing, maybe we will be facing a new uh, conflict, a new like um, battle by the city in the city of Hodeida between both sides. And this is for, for, from my point of view is the responsibility of the Houthis and the former president Ali Abdullah Saleh's forces. So uh, in, uh, in, in, in the south, yes. The Hussein, Hon in, in addition, what, what role or what responsibility do you think the international community has to address what is what is the worst humanitarian crisis? What, what role do they play in at least getting some sort of ceasefire or truce so medical aid can get in there? Um, uh, and I think the, um, for the city of Hodeida as well, uh, the Saudi-led coalition suggested that the United Nations could take control of the, of the city and could watch what is, what is getting in and what's getting out of the city so that the international humanitarian aid, the international um, um, uh, organizations, uh, food and supply, they could come easily to the city and they could uh, use it easily. But again, the United Nations refused because they said we cannot control it. We don't have enough uh, forces to control and to manage the port of, of uh, Hodeida. The problem is um, more complicated now because, as we know, it's humanitarian, it's economic, it is economical, and it is political. Now, I think that to solve this problem, the key ways is politics. They must go to a negotiation. Well, the Sheikh yesterday was in, or the day before was in Riyadh, and I think he will go to Sana'a again in order to retrieve and in order to get all parties together around a, a, a table in Kuwait or another city. This is the only solution because, okay. as we can know, no military solution will be uh, solving the problem. So it must be political solution in the country, and all parties must agree on the solution okay, to so, go to negotiation. So, so in the meantime, Dr. Varki, um, obviously peace seems very, very far away. But say that there, that there was something that all sides could at least agree on just to at least to get some sort of truce, to get help, to get aid in there. What what type of window would you all, what relief efforts need just to be even effective? I mean, how effective can you be in a few hours, a few days? Well, as you rightly said, humanity is indeed losing out to politics. And this is a serious concern. What we require both parties to do is, in addition to trying to have a peaceful resolution to the conflict, first, we want them to really respect international humanitarian law and really protect the rights of civilians and children. Second, we want both parties to make sure that civilian infrastructure is not harmed. We know that when health facilities or water systems are damaged, they make the conditions conducive to the spread of outbreaks. Third, we want both sides to ensure that they use their full force, all the means under their disposal, to ensure that people receive the appropriate care on time and that they specially allow services for civilians and children. This is of vital importance. Absolutely. I was, it is. Just, I was just coming back yesterday from visiting a hospital in Sana, where I met a mother with three children. All three children severely malnourished and fighting for their life. In addition to that, they had contracted diarrheal disease and they were receiving care. The husband had not received his salary since the last nine months and the family was already in debt. In this day and age, this is totally unacceptable. The international community must wake up, must put force on both parties to ensure some ray of hope for the Yemeni children. And that um, will be a very powerful last word. And thank you very much um, for that. Thank you to all of our guests, Hussein al Bukhari, Mohammed Jameh, and Dr. Sharon Varki. And thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime if you visit our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Rochelle Carey, and the entire team. Bye for now.